Chapter 18 The Return Journey When Bilbo came to himself, he was literally by himself. He was lying on the flat stones of Ravenhill and no one was near. A cloudless day, but cold, was broad above him. He was shaking and as chilled as stone, but his head burned with fire. Now I wonder what has happened, he said to himself. At any rate, I am not yet one of the fallen heroes, but I suppose there is still time enough for that. He sat up, painfully. Looking into the valley, he could see no living goblins. After a while, as his head cleared a little, he thought he could see elves moving in the rocks below. He rubbed his eyes. Surely there was a camp still in the plain some distance off, and there was a coming and going about the gate. Dwarves seemed to be busy removing the wall, but all was deadly still. There was no call and no echo of a song. Sorrow seemed to be in the air. Victory after all, I suppose, he said, feeling his aching head. Well, it seems a very gloomy business. Suddenly he was aware of a man climbing up and coming towards him. Hello there, he called with a shaky voice. "'Hello there. What news?' "'What voice is it that speaks among the stones?' said the man, halting and peering about him not far from where Bilbo sat. Then Bilbo remembered his ring. "'Well, I'm blessed,' said he. "'This invisibility has its drawbacks after all. Otherwise, I suppose I might have spent a warm and comfortable night in bed.' "'It's me, Bilbo Baggins, companion of Thorin,' he cried, hurriedly taking off the ring. "'It is well that I've found you.' said the man, striding forward. You are needed, and we have looked for you long. You would have been numbered among the dead. There were many, if Gandalf the wizard had not said that your voice was last heard in this place. I have been sent to look here for the last time. Are you much hurt? A nasty knock on the head, I think, said Bilbo. But I have a helm and a hard skull. All the same, I feel sick, and my legs are like straws. I will carry you down to the camp in the valley, said the man and picked him lightly up. The man was swift and sure-footed. It was not long before Bilbo was set down before a tent in Dale, and there stood Gandalf, with his arm in a sling. Even the wizard had not escaped without a wound, and there were few unharmed in all the host. When Gandalf saw Bilbo, he was delighted. Baggins! he exclaimed. Well, I never... Alive after all, I am glad. I began to wonder if even your luck would see you through. A terrible business, and it nearly was disastrous. But so the news can wait. Come, he said more gravely. You are called for. And leading the hobbit, he took him within the tent. Hail, Thorin, he said as he entered. I have brought him. There indeed lay Thorin Oakenshield, wounded with many wounds, and his rent armour and notched axe were cast upon the floor. He looked up as Bilbo came beside him. Farewell, good thief, he said. I go now to the halls of waiting to sit beside my fathers until the world is renewed. Since I leave now all gold and silver, and go where it is of little worth, I wish to part in friendship from you, and I would take back my words and deeds at the gate. Bilbo knelt on one knee, filled with sorrow. Farewell, king under the mountain, he said. This is a bitter adventure, if it must end so, and not a mountain of gold can amend it. Yet I am glad that I have shared in your perils. That has been more than any Baggins deserves. No, said Thorin. There is more in you of good than you know, child of the kindly West. Some courage and some wisdom blended in measure. If more of us valued food and cheer and song above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world. But sad or merry... I must leave it now. Farewell. Then Bilbo turned away 
And he went by himself and sat alone, wrapped in a blanket. And whether you believe it or not, he wept until his eyes were red and his voice was hoarse. He was a kindly little soul. Indeed, it was long before he had the heart to make a joke again. A mercy it is, he said at last to himself, that I woke up when I did. I wish Thorin were living, but I am glad that we parted in kindness. You are a fool, Bilbo Baggins, and you made a great mess of that business with the stone, and there was a battle in spite of all your efforts to buy it peace and quiet, but I suppose you can hardly be blamed for that. All that had happened after he was stunned, Bilbo learned later, but it gave him more sorrow than joy, and he was now wary of his adventure. He was aching in his bones for the homeward journey. That, however, was a little delayed, so in the meantime I will tell you something of events. The eagles had long had suspicion of the goblins mustering. From their watchfulness, the movements in the mountains could not be altogether hid. So they too had gathered in great numbers, under the great eagle of the Misty Mountains, and at length, smelling battle from afar, they had come speeding down the gale in the nick of time. They it was who dislodged the goblins from the mountain slopes, casting them over precipices, or driving them down, shrieking and bewildered among their foes. It was not long before they had freed the lonely mountain, and elves and men on either side of the valley could come at last to the help of the battle below. But even with the eagles they were still outnumbered, in that last hour, Bjorn himself had appeared. No one knew how or from where. He came alone, and in bear shape, and he seemed to have grown almost to giant size in his wrath. The roar of his voice was like drums and guns, and he tossed wolves and goblins from the path like straws and feathers. He fell upon their rear and broke like a clap of thunder through the ring. The dwarves were making a stand still about their lords upon a low rounded hill. Then Bjorn stooped and lifted Thorin, who had fallen pierced with spears, and bore him out of the fray. Swiftly he returned and his wrath was redoubled, so that nothing could withstand him and no weapon seemed to bite upon him. He scattered the bodyguard and pulled down Bolg himself and crushed him. Then dismay fell on the goblins and they fled in all directions. But weariness left their enemies with the coming of new hope and they pursued them closely and prevented most of them from escaping where they could. They drove many of them into the running river and such as fled south or west they hunted into the marshes about the forest river and there the greater part of the last fugitives perished while those that came hardly to the wood else rain were there slain, or drawn in to die deep in the trackless dark of Mirkwood. Songs have said that three parts of the goblin warriors of the north perished on that day, and the mountains had peace for many a year. Victory had been assured before the fall of night, but the pursuit was still on foot when Bilbo returned to the camp and not many were in the valley save the more grievously wounded. "'Where are the eagles?' he asked Gandalf that evening, as he lay wrapped in many warm blankets. "'Some are in the hunt,' said the wizard, "'but most have gone back to their ears. "'They would not stay here, and departed with the first light of morning. "'Dane has crowned their chief with gold, and sworn friendship with them for ever.' I am sorry. I mean, I would have liked to see them again, said Bilbo sleepily. Perhaps I shall see them on the way home. I suppose I shall be going home soon. As soon as you like, said the wizard. Actually, it was some days before Bilbo really set out. They buried Thorin deep beneath the mountain, and Bard laid the Arkenstone upon his breast. There let it lie till the mountain falls, he said. May it bring good fortune to all his folk that dwell hereafter. Upon his tomb the elven king then laid Orchrist, 
the elvish sword that had been taken from Thorin in captivity. It is said in songs that it gleamed ever in the dark if foes approached, and the fortress of the dwarves could not be taken by surprise. There, now Dane, son of Nain, took up his abode, and he became king under the mountain, and in time many other dwarves gathered to his throne in the ancient halls. Of the twelve companions of Thorin, ten remained. Philly and Kili had fallen defending him with a shield and body, for he was their mother's elder brother. The others remained with Dane, for Dane dealt his treasure well. There was, of course, no longer any question of dividing the hoard in such shares as been planned. To Balin and Dwalin and Dori and Nori and Ori, and Oin and Gloin and Biffa and Boffa and Bomba, or to Bilbo. Yet a fourteenth share of all the silver and gold, wrought and unwrought, was given up to Bard, for Dane said, We will honour the agreement of the dead and he has now the Arkenstone in his keeping. Even a fourteenth share was wealth exceedingly great, greater than that of many mortal kings. From that treasure, Bard sent much gold to the master of Lake Town, and he rewarded his followers and friends freely. To the elven king he gave the emeralds of Girion, such jewels as he most loved, which Dane had restored to him. To Bilbo, he said, This treasure is as much yours as it is mine, though old agreements cannot stand, since so many have a claim in its winning and defence. Yet, even though you are willing to lay aside all your claim, I should wish that the words of Thorin, of which you repented, should not prove true, that we should give you little. I would reward you most richly of all, very kind of you, said Bilbo, but really it is a relief to me. How on earth should I have got all that treasure home without war and murder all along the way? I don't know. And I don't know what I should have done with it when I got home. I am sure it is better in your hands. In the end he would only take two small chests, one filled with silver and the other with gold, such as one strong pony could carry. That will be quite as much as I can manage, said he. At last the time came for him to say goodbye to his friends. Farewell, Balin, he said, and farewell, Dwalin, and farewell, Dori, Nori, Ori, Oin, Gloin, Biffa, Boffa, and Bomba. May your beards never grow thin. And turning towards the mountain, he added, Farewell, Thorin Oakenshield. And Philly and Killy, may your memory never fade. Then the dwarves bowed low before their gate, but words stuck in their throats. Good bye and good luck, wherever you fare, said Balin at last. If ever you visit us again, when our halls are made fair once more, then the feast shall indeed be splendid. If ever you are passing my way, said Bilbo, don't wait to knock. Tea is at four, but any of you are welcome at any time. Then he turned away. The elf host was on the march, and if it was sadly lessened, yet many were glad, for now the northern world will be merrier for many a long day. The dragon was dead, and the goblins overthrown, and their hearts looked forward after winter to a spring of joy. Gandalf and Bilbo rode behind the elven king, and beside them strode Bjorn once again in man's shape, and he laughed and sang in a loud voice upon the road. So they went on until they drew near to the borders of Mirkwood, to the north of the place where the forest river ran out. Then they halted, for the wizard and Bilbo would not enter the wood even though the king bade them stay a while in his halls. They intended to go along the edge of the forest and round its northern end in the waste that lay between it and the beginning of the grey mountains. It was a long and cheerless road, but now that the goblins were crushed, it seemed safer to them than the dreadful pathways under the trees. Moreover, Bjorn was going that way too. 
Farewell, O oh, elven king, said Gandalf. Merry be the greenwood, while the world is yet young enough. And merry be all your folk. Farewell, O oh, Gandalf, said the king. May you ever appear where you are most needed and least expected. The oftener you appear in my halls, the better shall I be pleased. I beg of you, said Bilbo, stammering and standing on one foot, to accept this gift. He brought out a necklace of silver and pearls that Dane had given him at their parting. In what way have I earned such a gift, O oh hobbit? said the king. Well, um, I thought, don't you know, said Bilbo, rather confused, that um, some little should be made for your um, hospitality. I mean, even a burglar has his feelings. I have drunk much of your wine and eaten much of your bread. I will take your gift, O oh Bilbo the Magnificent said the king gravely, and I name you elf friend and blessed. May your shadow never grow less, or stealing would be too easy. Farewell. Then the elves turned towards the forest, and Bilbo started on his long road home. He had many hardships and adventures before he got back. The wild was still the wild, and there were many other things in it than those days beside goblins, but he was well guided and well guarded. The wizard was with him, and Bjorn for much of the way, and he was never in great danger again. Anyway, by midwinter, Gandalf and Bilbo had come all the way back, along both edges of the forest, to the doors of Bjorn's house, and there for a while they both stayed. Yuletide was warm and merry there, and men came from far and wide to feast at Bjorn's bidding. The goblins of the misty mountains were now few and terrified, and hidden in the deepest holes they could find, and the wags had vanished from the woods, so that men went abroad without fear. Bjorn indeed became a great chief afterwards in those regions, and ruled a wide land between the mountains and the wood. And it is said that for many generations the men of his line had the power of taking bare shape, and some were grim men and bad, but most were in heart like Bjorn, if less in size and strength. In their day the last goblins were hunted from the misty mountains, and a new peace came over the edge of the wild. It was spring, and a fair one with mild weathers and a bright sun, before Bilbo and Gandalf took their leave at last of Bjorn, and though he longed for home, Bilbo left with regret. For the flowers of the gardens of Bjorn were in springtime no less marvellous than in high summer. At last they came up the long road, and reached the very pass where the goblins had captured them before. But they came to that high point at morning, and looking backward, they saw a white sun shining over the outstretched lands. There behind lay Mirkwood, blue in the distance, and darkly green at the nearer edge, even in the spring. There, far away, was the lonely mountain on the edge of eyesight. On its highest peak, snow yet unmelted was gleaming pale. So comes snow after fire, and even dragons have their ending said Bilbo, and he turned back on his adventure. The Turkish part was getting very tired, and the Baggins was daily getting stronger. I wish now only to be in my own armchair, he said. 